So I am waiting on the Lord every day for his promised healing in my life. I know that I'm not the only one holding a promise today. If you're holding a promise from Jesus, just wait at me. And Jesus, we just want to say we know that you are good to your promises and we're going to hold to your promises to the very end until you fulfill them in our lives. I just want to send another shout. Bishop already did it, but I want to send another shout out to the Mount Vernon campus. Uh, I have I brought some books with me at Mount Vernon. We've got some books for you at your campus today, so you can get them as well. I have uh, here's what we're doing today. We are we are busting on Amazon today. We have got a deal for you at the table, so check it out on your way out. Uh, and if you get three books at the ten dollar special, I'm throwing and a copy of today's message sometimes we need trials so if you get three books you get the bright red book that comes with it bishop would you do me a favor would you hold up that fruitful heart book just so everybody can see it it's my uh the fruit yeah uh and and the smaller one that's the workbook the smaller one is the secrets of a fruitful heart i just wrote that this year and it's not, okay, I'm going to tell you, it's the strongest book on the parable of the sower that you are ever going to find. So get yourself a copy. It'll bless your heart and get three books on throwing this one in for free. So uh, that's today's message. You're welcome to stop by. Sarah will be there to take care of you on your way home today. God bless you. I need a little bit of help. I need somebody to come over here and help Kirk because, oh, Kirk, I want you to move that cross and bring it up on the platform for me. Somebody give Kirk a hand. I'm, I'm preaching on the cross. Just bring, I'm, I'm going to preach in the shadow of the cross today. So bring it nice and close. Beautiful. I'm a friend of the cross. Would it be okay with you if I preached on the cross today? Is that okay? Am I in the right house? The day that Jesus was crucified, nobody saw the cross. Everybody was staring at it, but nobody saw it. There wasn't a single person that stood in front of the cross and encouraged Jesus Christ. There wasn't a single person that stood in front of his cross and prophesied over him. You're the real Passover lamb. You're dividing human history in two. Now, you're running the greatest race of history. Run. You're fighting the greatest battle of history. Fight. There wasn't a single person that encouraged him that day. There wasn't a single person that stood in front of the cross and said to him, you're fulfilling Isaiah 53 right now, wounded for our transgressions, bruised for our iniquities, by your stripes were healed. Nobody talked to him like this. Nobody said to him, you're fulfilling Genesis 3.15 right now. You're taking it in the heel and you're giving it to the devil in the head. Nobody saw the cross. Everybody was staring at it and nobody saw it. The most important event of human history and Nobody knew what they were looking at. And I'm like, not much has changed. We're still not seeing.
the cross. Would you want to put your hands on your eyes as we pray? Heavenly Father, I'm asking that you'd open my eyes today. Would you put some eyes on me today and heal my eyes that I might see the cross. Wash my eyes of this covetousness. Wash my eyes of witchcraft. Wash my eyes of fornication, Jesus. Give me a clear vision today to see the cross like I've never seen it before. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. May Jesus answer that for you today. Our text this morning is Luke 24, verse 46. Luke 24, verse 46. Jesus is speaking these words on the evening of his resurrection. He's just come from the grave. He is meeting with his disciples for the first time after the resurrection. And most of what he says to them is going to be forward-looking. But the cross is so massive, he's got to say something about the cross. So he's going to debrief with them on the cross, and he basically has just one thing to say about his cross after the fact. And he said to them, Thus it is written, and thus it was necessary for the Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day. Notice what Jesus doesn't say. He doesn't say to them, That was the greatest injustice of human history, and it should have never happened. Notice what he doesn't say to them. Pilate really blew it. <laughs> Notice what he doesn't say to them. The chief priests are going to regret this. Notice what he doesn't say to them. He doesn't say, where were you guys? When I needed you most, you all disappeared. He has only one thing to say about his cross. He goes, it was necessary. It's a Greek word, day, D-E-I, and it means necessary. <laughs> Jesus goes, the cross was necessary. I had to do the cross to take on the devil. I had to do the cross to overcome sin. I had to do the cross to purchase your redemption. I had to do the cross to fulfill scripture. I had to do the cross to become the high priest of your confession. Jesus goes, the cross was necessary. Peter, in his epistle, is going to pick up the exact same word, day, D-E-I. And Peter is going to use it in his epistle. This is now 1 Peter 1, verses 6 and 7. Back to the earlier frame, please. That's verse 7. We want to see verse 6. In this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while, if need be, you have been grieved by 
various trials, that the genuineness of your faith, being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Come back to the earlier frame, please, verse 6. The Greek, verse, there, there it is. The Greek word, day, necessary, is found in this verse in that little caveat, if need be. In this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while, if need be. Literally, we could say it like this, if being necessary. Peter goes, Sometimes our fiery trials are also necessary. Now, listen to this carefully. By using the same word that Jesus used about his cross, Peter was making a direct connection between the cross of Christ and our fiery trials. And Peter goes, sometimes our fiery trials, just as the cross was necessary for Jesus, sometimes our fiery trials are also necessary for us. He goes, to certify the authenticity of our faith. Your faith, your trial is your certification. It is proving the authenticity of your faith. One of these days, you're going to stand in the presence of the angels, and they're going to look at your life, and they're going to say things like this. Look what she came through. She came through darkness. She came through struggle. She came through fire. Circumstances were against her. People were against her. Finances were against her. Her health was against her. Her friends were against her. Hell was against her. Temptation was against her. Her flesh was against her. And in all of that warfare, she stood and gave me her love. And on that day, heaven is going to look at your faith and go, it's the real deal. And heaven is going to put its official imprimatur, kuchunk, on your faith, proven authentic. Because you came through your fiery trial with your eyes still fixed on Jesus Christ. Verse 7 for the screen, please. That second frame, verse 7. Peter goes, he says, this is going to be to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Christ. And it's not going to be to your praise. They're not going to be talking about you that, that day. They're not going to be saying, did you see her run the race? Talk about Killer, she tore it up. <laughs> They're not going to be talking about you that day. They're going to be talking about the grace of Christ in spite of you, in spite of your weakness, in spite of your struggle. The grace of Jesus was enough even for you. And your faith is going to be a trophy to the grace of God in your life. And Peter goes, it's more precious than gold because gold will eventually perish, but this kind of faith will never perish. If you're going to get something that valuable, you 
just might need some fiery trials in your life. Just as the cross was necessary for Jesus, fiery trials, Peter goes, are sometimes necessary in our lives to certify our faith. Sometimes you don't know what you've got till you test it. Bishop took me for a ride yesterday in his Rivian. We pulled up to a red light and I said, Bishop, I want you to show me what this thing's got. <laughs> he hit the gas pedal when the green light came on, threw me into my seat. I'm like, you don't know what this car's got until you test it. There are some things in life you don't know what you've got until you test it. Character is not known until it's tested by temptation. Is Mount Vernon still there? <laughs> Love is not known until it's proven by hatred. Hello, Mount Vernon. You thought you loved everybody till they moved in next door. Faith is not known until it's proven by trials. Trials will freshen you up. This is Jeremiah 48, verse 11. Jeremiah 48, please. Moab has been at ease from his youth. He has settled on his drakes and has not been emptied from vessel to vessel, nor has he gone into captivity. Therefore, his taste remained in him, and his scent has not changed. Just keep it on the screen for a moment. The Lord is likening the nation of Moab to a vessel of wine. In the winemaking process, they pour the wine from this vessel into another vessel in order to get the wine off the drinks. You don't wine you don't want wine in the perfection process just sitting on the dregs because it gets stale and stagnant and stuffy and slimy. And the Lord said to the nation of Moab, Y'all just sat there. You were never disrupted as a nation. You were never poured from vessel to vessel. Y'all been sitting on your dregs for decades now, and y'all all stink. God goes, nations have a fragrance to me. I wonder what America smells like. Maybe it's a good thing, Kirk, that I don't know. <laughs> Churches have a fragrance to God. Individuals have a fragrance to God. I invite you to ask the Lord a question right now. Lord, what do I smell like? I 
think sometimes the Lord comes to us like this. You've been living in the same house, on the same street, working the same job, going to the same school, hanging out with the same friends, attending the same church for too long. We're going to mix this up. And we're over here going, what just happened to me? And the Lord's going, I'm freshening you up. Look at you now. You're back in the secret place. You're living in my word again. You've actually got the word of Christ, of Christ dwelling in your heart again. When you read the word, you're weeping again. You're in fasting and prayer again. There's a fresh light in your eyes. I've used this pouring from vessel to vessel to bring you back to your first love. You need it to be poured from vessel to vessel to get you off your dregs, get your love freshened up again. You've needed this past year. Just as the cross was necessary for Jesus Christ, Peter goes, sometimes our fiery trials are also necessary to certify our faith and to freshen us up. There's a place in the desert of Arizona called the biosphere. I'd be surprised if anybody here ever visited the biosphere. I've never been there. You can wave at me if you've ever visited. It's a tourist trap in the desert of Arizona. I've only Googled it. But here's what they did. They built these large domed buildings in the desert of Arizona. They called themselves the world's largest greenhouse. And they constructed these buildings to be entirely self-contained, self-sufficient. So if you lived inside one of these buildings, you had zero need to contact the external world. Everything you needed to live was inside of this building, growing your own food, the whole thing self-contained. And the purpose of this experiment was like this. They said, if we can support human life inside of this artificial environment in the desert of Arizona, maybe we can copy paste this thing, put it on Mars, and support human life on Mars. It was a speculative experiment. I think somebody had too much money. <laughs> and it didn't really work out very well, but it's still a tourist hangout still today. Somebody had an idea. They go, what if we were to grow fruit trees inside of this biosphere? We could give them perfect light, perfect temperatures, perfect irrigation, perfect fertilizer. We could grow fruit trees in perfect growing conditions. What would happen to fruit trees that are grown in perfect conditions? They said, let's give it a shot. So they planted these fruit trees in this artificial environment. And sure enough, they produced an abundant harvest. 
with just one problem. The branches of the trees kept snapping under the weight of the fruit. Because there was no wind in this artificial environment. Did you know that trees need wind? Trees need wind to keep their branches flexible so that when the fruit comes on the branches, the branches will flex with the fruit and the harvest will be preserved. But in the absence of wind, the branches of the trees became brittle and inflexible. And then when the fruit came on the branches, instead of flexing with the fruit, the branches snapped and broke. You've needed this win. You've actually needed this storm in your life. There's not a single person in the room that enjoys storms. We don't like the winds, but sometimes we actually need storms in our lives to keep us flexible so that we can support the fruit of our next season in God. Did you know that our planet actually needs storms? When I go to Florida and tell them we need hurricanes, they throw things at me. But it's true. We tend to look at the destructive side of storms, but there are beneficial things that we enjoy in our planet because of storms. They equalize our planet temperatures. They aquify the earth and they flush our planet clean. their nature's toilet system. <laughs> Just as the cross was necessary for Jesus Christ, Peter goes, sometimes our fiery trials are also necessary in our lives to certify our faith, to freshen us up and to get us flexible again so that we can support the fruit of our next season in God. The famous prayer from the 1905 Welsh Revival. Bend to me. I was coming home from Europe one time, and when you're on one of those long flights across the Atlantic, you look at that screen in front of you, and you're like, is there anything on this screen? And the answer is no. But on this flight, they had a documentary on winemaking. And I'm like, I've got the time. So I watched this documentary on winemaking on my flight. And in the documentary, they were explaining what produces a vintage wine. A vintage wine, as I understand it, is a wine from a particular season that 
because of the growing conditions of that season, it produced an uncommonly delightful wine. And they'll talk about it for years, the wine of 2012. If you can find yourself a bottle from 2012, you're going to pay for it. They're hard to find, but 2012, it was a vintage year. And in this documentary, they are explaining what produces a vintage wine. And I'm a novice watching this documentary, and I'm thinking to myself, I know what produces a vintage wine. Lots of sun, lots of rain, lots of warmth. Voila! And they go the opposite. They said to get a vintage wine, you must have an adversarial growing season. You must have conditions that are adversarial to the crop that force the vines to work harder. Too much sun, not enough sun. Too much rain, not enough rain. Too cold of temperatures, adversarial conditions conditions that stress the vines and force them to work harder. They said when a vine has to work harder in order to produce its crop, they said that's where you get a vintage wine. They said it like this. You'll never get a vintage wine from an unstressed vine. I just interpreted your last year. And then they go like this, they go, a farmer will never irrigate his crop in a drought. And I'm a novice watching this documentary, and I'm thinking to myself as a novice, bro, <laughs> this is exactly the time you need to irrigate your vineyard. Hello, there's no rain. Your vineyard is dying on you. If you love your vineyard, sir, you will irrigate your vineyard. You will keep your vines alive. And the farmer goes, no, if I irrigate my vineyard in this drought, the roots of the vines will return to the surface to capture the surface moisture. But if I intentionally stress the vines by intentionally withholding irrigation, the roots of those vines have only one direction to go. And now, under the duress of drought, the vines are desperate to survive. And in that desperate push to survive, they start pushing their roots deeper into the earth than they ever have before. 
pushing their roots into crannies and crevices and places in the earth that they've never reached into before. And now the roots of those vines are touching places in the earth that have never before been depleted. Does anybody in the room know that roots deplete the soil? But now the roots of the vines are going, now this is for the tricky fans in the house, going where no root has gone before. Touching untouched minerals, untapped nutrients, and they go, that's where you get a vintage wine. I call it holy desperation. When God turns the tap off, puts you into a holy drought where you can't hear God, you can't see God, you can't detect God. Everything is dark. And in your drought, you become desperate to survive. And you start pushing roots into Jesus like you've never had to in all your life. You actually start to fast and pray. You begin to live in the Word. You begin to push your roots into places in God that you've never had to go before. Holy desperation. And when the farmer withholds irrigation, the roots are forced to go deep. If you want to tweet it, you can tweet it like this. Stressed vines produce vintage wines. You've actually needed this trout. You have needed this drought to become so desperate for Jesus that you would put your roots into places in God that you've never gone to before. And because of your pursuit of God in your drought, he is now crafting a vintage wine with your life. Just as the cross was necessary for Jesus, Peter goes, sometimes our trials are also necessary in our lives to certify our faith, to freshen us up, to get us flexible again, and to craft a vintage wine with our love. I close with this verse on the cross. There's a verse in the Bible that says that when Jesus was on the cross, he worshiped his father. To find this verse, you don't go to the gospels. To find this verse, you have to go to David. It's in Psalm 22. When you come to Psalm 22, the whole psalm is a cross psalm. It begins like this. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? The whole psalm is embodying the cross. And when you get to verse 3, David goes, you are holy. And 
David shows us that when Jesus was on the cross, he worshipped his father and said to his father, You are holy. When you say to the Lord, You are holy, here's what you're saying. You are good. You are kind. You are faithful. You are gentle. You are true. You are compassionate. You are tender. You are generous. You are wise. You are mighty. You are powerful. You're working all things for the good. And when you say to the Lord, you are holy, you are talking about every beautiful attribute of God. You could go on for 10 minutes and talk about every glorious quality of God, or you could summarize it all in one word. You are holy. And when Jesus was on the cross with nails in his feet, nails in his hands, he stood on the nail, spread his arms, and said to his Father, You are holy. You have forsaken me, and you are holy. You have abandoned me. You've turned me over to the dogs, and you are holy. You've given, given me a bitter cup to drink, and you are holy. And when he was crucified, he had no accusation against his father. He said, you are good. You are kind. You are brilliant. Your leadership in my life is perfect. Your cup that you have given me, it's brilliant. And he worshipped his father in the most excruciating moment of his life with electricity flashing through his body with pain from head to foot he said you are holy <clears throat> gonna be personal Laverne did I get it right Laverne, I'm going to be personal for just a moment. When this happened to my voice, 32 years ago now, when this happened to my voice, every, every word is painful. When this happened to my voice, it catapulted me into darkness. I endured a 15-year depression. the darkness. I'm just telling you what it was like for me. I didn't know how to say thank you to the Lord for this trial. I could thank him in the trial, but I didn't know how to thank him for the trial. And I'm going to explain why. I've been given by the Lord some fantastic promises. He has promised to heal me. He has promised in his word. He has promised through his prophets. He has promised in the Holy Spirit. And I am holding him to his promises. I will never let go my promises. And I didn't know how to hold to my promises and at the same time say thank you for this trial. Because it seemed to me that if I said to the Lord, thank you for the trial, that then I was accepting it as my permanent condition for the rest of my life. And I cannot accept it as my permanent condition. He's the Lord, my healer. And I didn't know how to hold to my promises and say to him, thank you for this trial at the same time until I came again to our text would you give me our, our text again on the on the scripture on, on on the on the on the screen please psalm uh, excuse me luke 24 the very first verse then he said to them, Thus it is written, and thus it was necessary 
for the Christ to suffer and 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 to rise from the dead the third day just as the cross was necessary so was the resurrection and when you know that your resurrection is also necessary you can stand on your nail spread your arms and say to your father while you're on the cross you can say you are good you are kind you are merciful you are tender you are compassionate you are generous your leadership in my life it's perfect i have no accusation against you you are altogether lovely you are altogether good and you can worship him while you're on your cross therefore i have decided I'm not waiting until I'm healed before I say thank you. I'm not waiting for my resurrection before I love him and worship him. I'm going to love him now because I know just as this trial has been necessary, I understand it. It's been necessary to certify my faith, to freshen me up, to make me flexible in the spirit, to craft a vintage wine with my life just as my trial has been necessary so is my resurrection he never meant for the cross to be your last chapter he always meant for your trial to lead to resurrection. And today, my friends, I'm talking to Mount Vernon campus right now. Today, we have a resurrected Christ who is with us in the house. And I am asking Jesus for resurrection life to flow in this place today. Somebody that has been walking a trial with God and you're going to going to say thank you to Jesus today. You're going to say you are holy. You're going to love on the Lord. And there is coming resurrection life in the house here in New Rochelle and in Mount Vernon and in those watching online in Jesus name because today is a day for resurrection. Stand with me, please. I'm going to ask our worship ministry if they would take us to that medley of songs that they closed with, that forever holy and you are holy. Caleb, would you just wait on the music till I finish here? It just helps me with my voice. Thank you. So in a moment, we're going to sing that medley of songs again, and we're going to say to the Lord, you are holy. And I want to give somebody today an opportunity to step forward and sing it to the Lord in the front of this building to bring your branches with you. Those branches that are quivering in the stormy winds. Those branches that today you are going to lift to Jesus and say, you are good. You are kind. Your leadership in my life is perfect. Thank you for this trial. Thank you for the sufferings. Thank you for my participation in the cross because just as the cross was necessary Peter goes so sometimes our fiery trials are also necessary to certify our faith to freshen us up to get us flexible again in the spirit and to craft a vintage wine 
We're going to sing that song in just a moment. I'm going to finish in just a moment. And as we sing this song, I want to give you the opportunity, if you want to, to come and bring your branches and stand next to somebody else that's giving their love. You don't have to come forward if you want to stay where you are. That's fine. But even in Mount Vernon, you can step out of your seat, come forward to the front of the building there, and lift your hands to the Lord and say, you are are holy. I worship you for your goodness in my life, for your kindness in my life. I worship you. Your leadership is perfect. And I'm not waiting for my resurrection before I say it to you. I'm going to say it on the cross just like Jesus did. You are holy. If you come forward this morning and sing this song with us in the front of the sanctuary. You are giving me permission to lay my hand upon your head or shoulder very gently. I'll lay my hand upon you and agree with you in prayer in Jesus' name for the power of God to be with you today for his grace to strengthen you. He's going to strengthen knees that have buckled. He's going to strengthen hands that have hung low. He's going to give you a new pathway to walk in him. And you're going to set your eyes on your beloved just like Jesus did on the cross. And you're going to say to your beloved today, you are holy. If you sing it in the front, I'm going to join my faith with yours and believe for God to finish what he has started in your life.